Welcome to the Foundry, where leaders are forged daily. And now your host, George Roberts. Welcome back, entrepreneurs. Today, we welcome Zach Raisinger to the studio. Welcome, Zach. Thank you, George. How you doing, my man? Awesome. It's great to see you. We just got to see each other about a week ago on your Coffee with Closers show, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, we both had some cowboy hats on that day, so maybe we can name this episode Men Without Hats. Yeah, Men Without Hats. Hashtag. I like it. All right, Very good. Yeah, I don't think anyone's ever thought of that one before. <laughs> so why don't you start us off? Tell us the story of Zach. Yeah, I'm Zach Racinger. Thanks a lot, George, by the way, for having me on. Thanks for coming on Coffee with Closers. I hope you had Fun. a good time. And uh, I would just, yeah, I'll just jump right into it. I live in Austin, Texas. Uh, I am the son of a commercial real estate broker. So I grew up in commercial real estate. I have traveled to over 100 countries, so I spent uh, a lot of time in my 20s and 30s traveling around the world, learning new things, new cultures, new languages, new people, everything, uh, and I ended up here in Austin, Texas. I moved here from Brazil, uh, where I have uh, 20 hectares of land on the Northeast Coast, so I'm big into kiteboarding, and that's sort of a mecca for high, uh, kiteboarding, but uh, I got uh, a little bit tired of having uh, sand always in my underwear. And uh, I moved to Austin, Texas, where we don't wear underwear. No, I'm just kidding. We wear <laughs> uh, Sometimes when it's too hot. But uh, yeah, no. So I live in Austin, Texas, and uh, I work here, uh, do three distinct things. I work in brokerage. So I sell, uh, I help uh, buyers also buy, but I help buy and sell uh, commercial real estate, industrial, land, warehouse, uh, you name it, I sell or buy it. Um, and I'm here just to provide value to my clients and anybody who needs advice. I'm more than welcome to give it, uh, even those who don't ask. No. Um, and then I work for a syndication uh, or a syndicator. Uh, and we work on deals here primarily in uh, Texas or throughout Texas. And then I have a uh, course that teaches people to particularly those that are in their first year of commercial real estate to get their first listing and their first closing within six months. And it's the CRE Pro Course. It's available at creprocourse.com. And it has proven strategies. I uh, worked in the, on this with my partner from Next Level. Uh, so we're in uh, Dan Lukowitz is his name. He is probably a friend of your shows and the show. And I'm sure several people have watched Dan on the Foundry. And uh, yeah, just a, an amazing guy, uh, triple net rock star. And we got together uh, through Next Level Mastermind run by Adam Carswell. Uh, and we uh, found that there was a need for people who wanted to get into commercial real estate. They were a little bit skeptical because they heard how long it takes to close their first deal. And we said, we can expedite that process. We've been through all the hard hardships. We've made the cold calls. We found out what works and what doesn't. And we took both of those and put those into the course and showed you show people how to uh, close their first deal, how to follow up on those deals, how to amplify business and really how to provide value uh, to your team, your, your brokerage within that first year. Because George, as you know, it is sometimes really difficult if you're coming from another industry or you're in residential and you're moving to commercial and you're like, I don't know what to do. What do I, you spend first few months just trying to figure it out. And some people just don't have you know, six months or a year to close their first deal. So we amplified that process and we sped it up, put all this knowledge into one course. And uh, it's just the, it's phenomenal, George, how, how much it has meant to so many people and how often I, I get a phone call or I get an email and someone says, I've always wanted to take my family to Hawaii and I've never been able to afford to. I closed my first commercial deal in two months. Uh, in the first two months of taking your course. While I was taking the course, I was closing my first deal and I just took my family to Hawaii. Uh, so those make me feel good. I never, that was never the goal or the intention, but it was the unintended result of helping people achieve their goal and also not struggle through some of the heartaches that exist in commercial real estate because we just laid out our knowledge in, a, in an easy to digest 26 module format. That's a lot on, uh, on CRE Pro Course, um, but 
I, I, the reason that I originally got on and came on to your show on the foundry is because you and I have a very similar mentality. And that is uh, that it's the one to many and it's the consume at your own leisure uh, approach to doing business. I'm not trying to jam anything down someone's throat, but rather I want them to view the videos. I want them to see the foundry and uh, watch the, the episodes that make sense to them, that, that uh, are of interest to them, that they can learn from, and they can watch it multiple times. And then when they're ready, they reach out to George for multifamily syndication. Thank you. I appreciate that plug. So we can actually talk a little bit more about CRE Pro. I think it is uh, very exciting. You have a great story behind it. Oh, there you go. CRE uh -huh. Pro course, baby. All right. Uh, I hope you're watching on YouTube because you just got to see that snazzy logo. Very good. <laughs> awesome stuff. <laughs> but uh, your, your CRE Pro, tell us how you got involved in that. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I have a partner uh, uh, that I worked with it on originally. Uh, his name is Dan Lukowitz. And uh, he comes out just very close to where you are. He's outside, he's outside of um, uh, in Farmington Hills in, in Detroit. And uh, we would have never met if it were not through a mastermind. I highly suggest if you have the opportunity to get into a mastermind to do so. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was uh, working in, in syndication while I was working uh, for a, an opportunity zone fund. And uh, for your viewers who may know, viewers and listeners that may know what that is, uh, uh, essentially um, during the Jobs Act, a, an, a, an investment vehicle to mitigate the uh, capital gains tax that someone would feel, whether it's through real estate or, or you buy a Porsche and sell the Porsche 10 years later, and it has gained value, you would pay a pretty steep pay, uh, tax on capital gains. And so you can mitigate some of that. If it's in real estate, you can go to a 1031 or a DST. But if it's not in real estate and you made it maybe on Bitcoin, your Bitcoin crushed it, and you don't want to pay capital gains tax on that, you can invest in an opportunity zone fund and hold it for quite a bit of time. But if you don't need the money back and you'd like to make some income on that, you can do so uh, in special zones that help areas around the United States that may need a little bit more help or outside investment. So I was working uh, in that and uh, we, were we were focusing primarily on QSR, so fast food restaurants, uh, the real estate side of it. And I do the, I do the build or the acquisition, the build, and then uh, potentially the sale of those QSR restaurants on hard corners. I uh, was under contract to do one in San Antonio for a bank on a hard corner. And you may say, well, banks have nothing to do with fast food. And my contention on that would be where are banks located and who goes to banks? So where are banks located? They're on high VPD, high vehicles per day. Uh, main and main, we call it main, main downtown uh, corners because they're easy to get to. Uh, they have good ingress and egress, which means you can get into and out of them quickly, and they have drive-through lanes. But how many people these days still go to a bank? And if you do, uh, do they need all those lanes? Do they need all those locations? Uh, could you just go to an ATM instead? Well, we were finding a lot of the banks during the pandemic were starting to go dark. Uh, in other words, the banks were either shutting down or they were closing branches. And I was looking uh, very hard at one uh, to, to turn it into a QSR or fast food restaurant so we could just use essentially the same lanes, the same ingress, egress. And this one in particular did not have a vault in the middle of it. So sometimes a, built, a bank will be built around a vault. Uh, vault is dangerous for most people to, uh, I don't know, to put an oven in or a, a fryer in, but this one didn't have an oven in it. So I had a few of them under contract. The one we were talking about in particular, uh, I brought to Dan on his, nice. uh, his show, Dan on top. People love the episode. And uh, Dan said, you know, I, I just received this invite for LinkedIn Live. I don't have any idea what it is, but he is an quote unquote influencer on LinkedIn. And so he said, I, you know, I had a really good time doing, doing this with you on the show. And Next Level Mastermind has been good for us. So why don't we uh, go on to LinkedIn Live together? And I said, sure. I, I mean, I love just like you do, George. I love talking about real estate. Uh, we were we found out by talking to each other. Dan and I said, you know, what do we do most? What do we spend most of our time doing? And uh, particularly during the work, work week. 
or even on the weekend, and it's talking about real estate or it's answering questions for people on real estate, they say, I, I love to get into brokerage, but I don't really understand what you guys do all day. Uh, what, you know, how, or how much do you make or how do, why do you make so much? And so uh, we have these conversations. I mean, I was having three, four a week and Dan said, yeah, so am I. And, I, and we said, well, let's talk about some of those things on this LinkedIn Live. What, do, what does a commercial real estate agent do? What do brokers do? Uh, how to do better? What have we found that does well? And, and we also talked about the things that we love, uh, like QSR, fast food restaurants, or uh, uh, last mile delivery and warehouses, and what's going to happen to the future of retail after the pandemic. All of the above were uh, of, of interest. It's people just like you and I, George, that just love to think about, we drive by a building and say, is that the highest and best use? Or could, could we put something else in there? Or it's dark. I've got a great idea. I can go reach out to this uh, uh, retailer that I know that's looking for space and maybe they can get a, a good lease in there because it's vacant at this time. So uh, we just brought those ideas to the show. We did it for an hour. We found that at the end of the hour, people still wanted more. And uh, somebody said, oh, hey, uh, I got, and because it's a LinkedIn Live, you can um, both ask questions along the sidebar. You can interact with the, with the hosts. And people were asking us questions about real estate and as we were very used to, and we had these answers because we answer these questions all the time. But uh, at the end, someone said, excuse me, uh, Zach and Dan, how much is your course? And I, of course, started going, oh, we don't have a, and Dan goes, Just shut up. Uh, <laughs> uh, how much would you pay for this course? And I was like, oh no, what is he doing? Uh, so they said, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm paying right now a, a few hundred dollars uh, a month for access to XYZ program, or uh, we pay at uh, JLL or CBRE or EXP or Keller Williams commercial, or well, here's what we pay. And people were entering in the sidebar. Yeah, yeah, we do that too. And, and it's not that great, but you guys are interesting. And you're talking about things that we want to learn. And by the way, I, I think I can use these things. And I was thinking, oh, there's some value being created there. And so we got, as we uh, brought an end to the show, Dan called me immediately and says, Zach, we got to do this. There is a need. Right. People are telling us that, you know, what they would pay for it. So now we're right. starting. And he said, you need to put a button up on the internet. We just need to yeah. think of a name for a course, put a button on mm -hmm. the internet and start collecting money. And I was like, I, I think I can write this. I think we can do this. Uh, I dropped a button on, on the internet and all of a sudden it's a classic internet story. Bing, 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 bing. People are hitting the button and he said, no, no, turn it off, man. It's too cheap. And I said, what is too cheap? We don't have anything. It's you click, you click, I want it. And then it says, thank you very much for your payment. That's it. So we went on the next week. We went on to another LinkedIn live and we said, okay, what would you like to see in this course? It's being built right now. Tell us what you'd like to see in it. And we've got some pre-sales going right now. So if you want to uh, get in early on this, uh, we'll, we'll give it to you the original price of $50. Um, so through that, we really built a course around what people were interested in, not necessarily the, the CCIM, which is very easy to, uh, to look up today. You can find the terms and you know, cap rate hasn't changed. Uh, but they say, well, how do you find listings? I, I don't get it. I mean, I understand what you do. I understand financial right. modeling but how do you find the listings? Uh, how do you get new customers? How do you, and so we just, you know, I was writing these things down feverishly as we were talking to people and uh, sort of started structuring a course. We went to a TV studio and we shot the, uh, we shot it uh, in actually in Detroit, flew out to Detroit and we shot uh, on professional cameras, multiple angles. I really think that has a lot to do with it, George, because that's, you know, what you and I talk about quite frequently, the production value and the amplitude. And, and uh, through that, we developed the course and often it's, it's brought up to my attention. And, and I, I like when Dan says, you know, a lot of people have podcasts, but George, not everybody has a, a, a video streaming uh, service or a, or a zoom, you know, recorded YouTube channel. So everybody's sort of like one upping each other, but a lot of people have podcasts. Not everybody has a video like you have. And a friend of mine said at the time, he goes, I don't know anybody that has a course. You have your own course on commercial real estate. You teach commercial real estate. And through this, George, it, you know, it's just taken off for both Dan and I and, and the entire CRE Pro network. The bigger we get, 
the more compounding effect it has. And, and again, it makes my heart feel good when somebody goes to a, an SEC 1031 exchangers conference and they both say, you know, I just got out of the CRE pro course and they connect immediately. They're like, okay, you get it. You and I both know that to a certain level, right? They've, they, they understand all of the basics of commercial real estate. They understand how to do a transaction, how to database. They understand uh, how to take it from, we say soup to nuts, right? A to yeah. Z, how to take a deal from just an idea all the way through listing, selling, and then uh, eventually turning that into a lifelong customer. So for all the above, it's just seemed to uh, just really um, add a lot of value and at the same time, um, provide, provide me with some, some good feeling uh, behind it, behind helping people. Awesome stuff. Well, let's get back to some of those definitions. You mentioned QSR and hard corners. I want to make sure everybody understands what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, I'll, I'll attack this in a few different ways, George, because it's something that I had to learn and, and something that I love about commercial real estate is that you can never get too comfortable. You should always be pushing your own boundaries. You should always be learning about new things, exploring new concepts or ideas. One of those was franchising. I didn't know anything about franchising before I got into the QSR. So quick service restaurant. It's a, I would say it's a sort of an elite term maybe for uh, fast food because it, it encompasses almost everything. Um, some people think of McDonald's and I, I've been guilty of saying this. A lot of people do say, oh, I, I don't remember the last time I ate McDonald's or I don't like McDonald's, but then they have the equal number of calories in a Chipotle or something. So fast food restaurants like to differentiate themselves based on uh, many factors, relatability, right? So everybody's been in, a, in, a, in an airport and said, oh, I only have a few minutes. I could, I could go with the salad, which I should go with, but also I really like Big Macs. Uh, so we all have that uh, identification with uh, QSR, fast food restaurants. And these QSRs are trying to get onto high uh, volume uh, per day or vehicle per day corners. Um, that A main and main would be sort of a, uh, if you think of a small town, it would be where all of the streets intersect in the, in the center. Well, if you're in Detroit, there's going to be a thoroughfare where cars are going, let's just say 35 to 40 miles an hour, uh, and they can easily pull off, but it also gets you from A to B quickly, and it's surrounded by other businesses that if you're stopping in for a sweet greens uh, salad and you want to also get your mobile phone fixed next door in the same inline center, um, <clears throat> these are these are ideal locations for certain businesses. So if you're a if you're a um, Burger King or a Taco Bell, you want to be where they're uh, main and main, where a lot of people are passing. They understand and identify with your sign. They can pull in. The line is not uh, backed up into the street, sort of like the Chick Fil A thing. Right. Uh, where everybody, I mean, rightfully so, everybody loves chick, uh, it's Chick-fil-A. Amazing. <laughs> but they call it stacking, right? So if you, it, it's really not good for the city where you have a Chick-fil-A who hasn't planned for all of these cars. Uh, you may have seen this before, George, where you're driving down the road and there's a, there's a traffic jam, but just in one lane, and then you realize it's Chick-fil-A. So uh, yeah. they've done a pretty good job to try to solve that with their runners, but sometimes you just have too many cars and uh, you know, don't offer another, uh, other alternatives. Uh, there is a friend of ours called uh, Hum Dinner. I want to give a shout out to Gabe Jonas and uh, uh, Kevin. They have a, a company which is essentially the reason we got, so, we got along so well is because their concept is using essentially like the bank, like the tube, uh, the vacuum tube to deliver the food. You can order ahead, you can pull through, and if you've ever ordered a Starbucks and they have it ready for you already, because you already know what you want, it really quick, you know, the whole line goes really fast and you can, you don't have to worry about stacking into the road. Uh, with the, with the QSR, um, it's a high, it's a high volume, low margin business. Um, so you want to find somewhere where people can access the food, either walk up, they can get it through drive through uh, or, or delivery is a really big one now, as well as, as you know. Chipotle is a good example of that, where they've morphed their business. People know what they want. They have their exact order always in mind, and uh, they don't need to be in the main and main. They can be in, a, in an inline center, and people already know what they want. They order ahead, or they get it delivered. So for all the above, 
Um, QSRs are, uh, and if you think about it too, George, they turn over a lot. You may know uh, uh, of a McDonald's who's been there forever, but you may also know a Cabo Bob's that uh, changes changes hands to a Pollo Loco and to a, it changes hands uh, quite frequently. And it's because it's in a good location, but maybe the business wasn't a right fit. So demographics really matter when you're starting to place a business that has low margins. Right. So before we leave the QSRs and the bank to QSR conversion, I just got to say, would think that that vault might actually be a good asset, right? I mean, where else do you store the secret sauce or the secret <laughs> recipe, right? <laughs> Always the salesman there, George. Uh, yeah, uh. <laughs> I think that uh, they, they have a place for that. Um, <laughs> what they end up doing a lot of times, George, in that case, they, they can sometimes they can pull it out. Um, usually the structure is built on top of it. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes you'll find a bank, um, if, if it's a large bank, a Chase, uh, Bank of America, or Wells Fargo, they have a protection clause. Uh, they, they don't want to be there, but they don't want anybody else there either. So they're trying to keep other banks out of it, which is tough because who wants a vault in the middle of their, of their store? Well, uh, other than storing the secret sauce, George, you may have seen this before. We have one here in Austin. There's one in Denver. And uh, the, many times restaurants will turn it into a, a fine dining location, right? It's pretty cool. You've got all of this uh, safety deposit boxes or they have the giant glass door that has that you can see inside and see the uh all the gears turning and it just reminds me of every every oceans 11 uh video where i see inside of the locks it's pretty pretty cool concept for a bank but right. it's often repurposing george i mean i do believe that our value as commercial real estate agents partic and, and brokers uh syndicators in 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 your case as well is bringing a fresh new set of ideas to what might be considered a trite uh, concept. So again, if the QSR isn't working on the corner, what else might work there? What else needs uh, right. a high VPD? And you know, I'm uh, I'm 40 years old, and I have a business partner who's in his 60s. I said, you know, we've really got a good idea going after these banks. And he said, Zach, you are so young. He said, before the banks, it was a dry cleaner, and before a dry cleaner, it was a. And I said, oh. Now I understand, right? It's all cyclical and whatever's right. hot at the time is going to have that, whatever can pay the most is going to have that main and main corner. And once it becomes out of fashion, mm -hmm. I mean, a dry cleaner is a great example right now, George. I, I don't know the last time that I, I went to the dry cleaner, but as I was going to the office every day and I was driving downtown and I wanted to put on the, the nice suit or I had a, an engagement to go to a function, uh, I wanted to clean my tuxedo. All of those things uh, require a dry cleaner. And I was passed back and forth uh, along uh, the main street and I would drop, drop it off or pick it up. Well, today, uh, that guy might be kind of struggling because if they, in particular during, during the pandemic, because if, if uh, people are not going to functions where they need a, a dry clean suit or their dress to be uh, you know, looking great uh, as often as they were, that might hurt their margins. So it's always thinking about like what is coming next and why right. is it doing that? Yeah. I love those banks too. If you like Cleveland, you might know about the marble room. That was the old Rockefeller's bank, national city and downtown. Yep. You can, you actually, I got to pay a lot of money. If you want to go down in the basement uh, with the vaults and they'll let you set up a party down there. But yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, there was a time that you needed all that marble because that's what convinced people that you could actually, you know, you, you don't have a run on the bank because they say like, oh yeah, they, you know, they're good for it. Right. And uh, now we've got these, I mean, it's almost like cardboard, how they build the banks today. It's nothing like what it used to be in the future. There's, there's no marble, no granite, no limestone. <laughs> so now all those places, they become nightclubs and restaurants. I've got a I've got a question for your audience here, George. Whether you're on the Foundry and you want to email this in, or if you're on uh, YouTube, this is an honest question that I have. I could look it up, but I I would love to hear from your audience. Who had more money, uh, Carnegie or Rockefeller? Who do you think, George? Oh, it's got to be Rockefeller. Uh, I I know that Carnegie. I mean, he. I want to say he got sixty three million dollars when he sold U.S. Steel. To Morgan, and yeah. you remember the the famous uh, yeah. story, right? They're both yeah, on the yacht. Yeah, I remember yachts. this. Yeah, and he says, "Yeah, you know, uh, 
I should have asked for a hundred. And Morgan says, well, yes, you should have, because I would have paid it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to say Rockefeller, I think was one of the most, uh, the wealthiest people on the planet. The at, reason at the that I, death. the reason that I bring this up, George, is that uh, I'm approached frequently I'm approached frequently by uh, vendors of all type, right? Because you and I are very public. We're out there. Uh, we're trying to uh, generate business and provide value on LinkedIn. I get a lot of times that people will come to me and say, hey, I would like to, essentially, they're like, I have 15, 20 minutes of your time. And I'm good with it if it's in real estate, because I love to teach people about real estate or I love to get their feedback on it. But if it's about uh, financial advising or insurance, I give them some time because I really want to hear how they sell. I really want to, if you're coming from a large uh, Raymond James or something, you've been coached to, to sit, to sell prospect clothes in a very distinct way. And I'm always trying to learn how do other companies, how do big multinational multi-billion dollar companies, how do they teach their salespeople to sell? So I'll take those calls. Uh, in, in particular, one we took yesterday, uh, my partner and I took with a trust uh, of CPA and a guy uh, that was trying to sell uh, the concept of a trust. And the only reason I bring this up, George, is it does relate to real estate uh, in, in three ways. So first of all, I said, oh, no, I get it. We love 1031s. And they said, yeah, 1031 is great if they want to go into real estate. I said, well, how about a DS or, or own real estate? I said, well, how about a DST? Is this the same thing? He said, no, no, no. This is a trust and a trust is essentially creating an entity where you put money into and you uh, mitigate the tax uh, you would pay on capital gains, but you don't have to spend it on real estate. You could, but you can spend it on a lot of other things too. And it's generational wealth. And the way that he started this off is the same way that I just did a webinar on 1031 with a very prominent 1031 uh, gentleman uh, named Greg Lehrman about two weeks ago. And uh, he started off the same way, saying this is one of the oldest ways to protect your capital. But the the trust guy uh, from yesterday, he said, do you know who uh, Rockefeller is? I said, yes. He said, you know what? In 1914, uh, they started to, they created a fund and they created a trust. And he has never used the 1031 because I said, I'm trying to get my clients to buy more real estate. I want them to buy more real estate and I want them to use me to do it. Uh, and so he said, you know, that's, that might be the right solution for a lot of people, but for Rockefeller and uh, his heirs, they really benefited because they put the money in, the, in this certain type of trust. So yeah. I was very interested to hear that, that, that Rockefeller never did a 1031. Nice. Well, you know, uh, great that you mentioned Andrew Carnegie because he was the one who I believe coined or maybe... Um, repopularized the idea of it being shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. And I know that that was definitely the case for the Vanderbilts. You go out, I think it was not until maybe the fifth or the sixth generation, you got Gloria Vanderbilt. And then um, in her own way, she became a millionaire, but was self-made, right? She was not born into the Vanderbilt wealth, but somebody like Rockefeller, I mean, I think he really essentially created the family office industry. He I refer to him like Johnny out, D. That's my. Uh, yeah, that's right. Johnny D. John Davison. <clears throat> and uh, he, he really figured out how to make sure that that doesn't happen. And I, I'm kind of of two minds on it. I mean, I certainly want to see uh, the family wealth tick on as long as it can, as many generations out. But I'm also afraid, uh, I don't want to mention any names, but I think some families, they, they do have these uh, so called trust fund babies. And uh, anyway, that creates another problem. You've got to figure out how to structure it so that maybe if you want a million dollars, you've got to earn 50,000 in a year or something like that. Yeah, there's the they duality behind it, George. And I, and I absolutely see this in real estate uh, as well as just you know, being around wealth quite frequently that uh, it, it really depends on the character, I believe, of the parents uh, as well yes. as the children. Sometimes you have children that have the same parents and they, uh, they react differently to having money. One will really be excited about helping their, uh, their father or mother uh, manage the, pro the portfolio of real estate properties. They like to go out there. They want to be an active participant. They want to learn about it. And other people say, I'm not so interested in that. It's easy. Why, you know, why, why would I want to spend so much time at the office? So I think a lot has a lot to do with the character. Real estate is one of those things that uh, it is 
possible uh, to get into with very little training. I mean, if you want to buy real estate, you don't have to have any training. Uh, I think it's important to, to at least become knowledgeable about what you're buying, but you can get into a lot of things. Fundrise makes it very easy to get into a syndicated portfolio or buying into a REIT or, uh, you know, you could do exactly what you and I do, uh, George, which is get together with a few friends, find one that knows a lot about real estate and you bring, maybe you bring the money and then you, you team up together and you buy something. Uh, they teach you about real estate. You provide maybe a little bit extra capital and you guys, you become uh, partners in a deal. And then you can learn through and leverage that and you get more excited once you start to learn about it. Oftentimes, People say, should I go get my MBA in, uh, in real estate? Should I uh, take more schooling on it? And my suggestion as it, it's maybe sometimes self-serving, which is you should absolutely uh, get into um, the CRE Pro course, but learn about it in a method that uh, teaches you how to leverage that and use that. You know, For $500, you get into the CRE Pro course to learn everything about commercial real estate. Right. But then you can use that to purchase real estate of your own, commercial real estate or, right. uh, or your house or a rental or whatever it is. So you get into that and you start learning more and you get more excited about it. You leverage that and you can, you can build it up uh, into an entire portfolio of properties. So uh, real world application, I believe, trumps uh, a formal education if you're trying to get into commercial real estate ownership and leveraging those properties. It is a good idea, though, George, I think if you're going to go into the financial uh, sector uh, for portfolio man management or structuring deals to have some formal education on how to structure and fin a finance, you know, financially structure a deal uh, and prove it out, right? Run it through a model, create a model, run it through a model and find out, does it work? Does it pencil, as they say? Love it. And since you did mention... CRE Pro Course, one more time. I think you've got a great story about the first time somebody called up and said, hey, we've got somebody who has this credential, uh, CRE Pro Course. Help us understand what exactly does that mean? Yeah, so if, uh, as you go through the course, uh, there are six um, sections. Each has uh, four to six modules inside of a total of 26 total modules. Uh, and then at the end, uh, if you, and you have to pass each section to move to the next section. So it's a comprehension mm -hmm. piece where we want to make sure that everybody has watched the videos. Uh, you can fast forward and rewind through the videos. Right. Um, but once you get to the end of the videos and at the very end of it, you, you receive a designation. So a CRE pro course designation. Right. And the great part about that is when when you do, you then can put that on your LinkedIn profile. Well, it's a really good way to, to identify somebody else that has also invested right. in themselves and in their career and that they're trying to they're trying to make something of themselves beyond what is available uh, again as a uh, in a CCIM course or a, a free YouTube video or whatever it is. All of those are good. But when you find somebody has invested in themselves, you know that they're serious about what they're trying to do. And so the it's not just commercial real estate agents that take the CRE pro course. It actually is a lot of other professionals. So, you know, if you think about it, you're trying to sell to a commercial real estate agent. We have a, we had a, a guy who was doing drone videos and he's like, I don't understand what the concerns are of commercial real estate agents and how they get their videos up online. And I said, most of them don't, most of them uh, don't use drone videos because they're confused about your subject as well. And he said, a great way for me to learn about and how to sell to somebody is to take the courses that they're taking. So somebody who's getting into real estate and it's in their first year and they're trying to close their first deal and they're out there and they're trying to prospect. And the great way to prospect is to send a drone video to somebody to say, hey, here's your property. I think I can market it for this amount of money or let's talk about what you're trying to do with this property because I think it's beautiful. And even if you don't, uh, use me to list the property. I want you to have this drone video. It costs almost nothing once he once he realized how much it actually cost. And he shot all the properties around it. And then he just took a map uh, as we have access to things like CoStar or, or the MLS or, or whatever, or even uh, CAD. So the central appraisal di district for each county has a map of who owns the property. So you can simply go and find out who owns the property and send them a drone video of their property and give them some comps in the area, what other things have sold for, 
and say, look, if you're ever interested in selling, uh, I'm a great guy or a great person to do that. And, and by the way, here's what it looks like from 500 feet up. The guy did the drone video, edited it, put in some rock star music, a guy pumped up about his property. It was, it was farmland or something. And it, he's like, this is the most excited I've ever been about farmland. And it, it, but he's got this cool music going. And at the end of it, he said, hey, just give me, you know, give me a call. So they worked out a deal with the drone guy that if any of these closed or any of them went under contract and closed, he'd give him a, you know, he'd, he'd pay him uh, for a certain amount of it. And so the guy was motivated to do really great drone footage. If nothing came of it, he's, his business card is still on it. Maybe they decide to do something else, but it's great advertising. He learned that one of the struggles and frustration is that uh, drone uh, real estate, commercial real estate guys are terrible at uh, navigating drones. We don't know very much about technology. And one of the cool parts about that is like he already had all the equipment and he was already in the area. So I think that's a great opportunity to learn about a new find out for a very small investment. What are some of the concerns? What are some of the other ideas? What are some of the struggles that someone is facing just by taking a course where they're trying to learn how to solve those themselves? So Another one would be aerials. We struggle uh, in brokerage to get really great aerial shots. That guy's already up there in the drone, shoots a 360, sends that to everybody and says, hey, would you like to see why we, in, in real estate, particularly in, in retail, we like to show where the tra traffic patterns are going and where the nearby retailers are that are symbiotic or where people would be coming to already go shopping again to, uh, for the Example earlier, they're going to get their phone fixed at the AT&T store. Well, I would love if I was Chipotle to be next to an AT&T store because they never fix it immediately, but they fix it in 30 minutes. So pop next door, get a burrito. So all of these things are important, but we just don't often take the time. And if somebody's already giving it to you and they say, here's an aerial shot of your property, here's what I'd highlight, by the way, sir, you're right, you know, this your building is right next door to a gas station or, you know, whatever it might be. A coffee shop is located close to a lunch spot or a UPS drop-off spot. It takes a very little amount of time with that aerial to say, here's where I would, here's where I would like to invest, or here's where I would suggest buying, or here's where I would sell, or here's who I'd sell to. It's really great prospecting. And he learned all of that through the CRE pro course. And he's not even a real estate agent. He's not a broker, but I'm trying to convince him to get into it. I love it. Awesome story. Anything else you want to add for our audience? No, but uh, the, the last thing I do want to say, I want to appreciate what you do, George. Um, you're one of the hardest grinders I've ever seen out there. And, and I, I can tell that you are a, not only a trained biologist, but a scientist by your training and background and your interests and your knowledge. And the reason I say that is you create a process behind uh, everything you do. And what I mean by that is oftentimes I find inside of my own brokerage that we're very haphazard on how we approach a situation. And your brain and mine, George, are very similar where I want to create a standard process that everybody can follow. It can be repeated and scaled. That's how we make money in our brokerage is we bring on new agents. They don't have a, a, an idea of what they're doing. Of course, I have them go through the CRE pro course. But once they do that, then specifically inside of my brokerage, I need a step-by-step -step process for them to follow so that they can, they know where they're going. They can navigate, they can ask me questions, but they can navigate through it on their own. In your case, when you're doing the one-to-many, so I love the idea that you're trying to get your, uh, your name, your uh, multifamily syndication, the foundry, and, and many other things that you're doing. Uh, in front of as many people as possible using that you know, one-to-many philosophy. In order to do that, you want to eliminate as many bottlenecks or roadblocks as possible for your audience and your guests to be able to help you do that. As an appreciation to you for hosting me, I want to help you, but I don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about how to help you. If you provide me the content, if you provide me the channels, if you provide me the links, I will do all of it for you immediately. Plus, you do it before the show as well. So your, your team does a great job. I've always said this. Their team does a great job of mocking up artwork, uh, collecting all the uh, links for me and what I'm trying to do so that you can help me promote me before the show or us, I should say, uh, yeah. George. But you help me do that. And so it's easier for me to promote me. I don't think it doesn't feel like 
I am um, grandstanding prior to getting on your show, but I'm more so saying, hey, look, I'm going to be on the Foundry later today. This is yeah. a great show. Here's all about <laughs> here's all about George, and here are all of his 60 guests he just had on. Look at how cool right. these guys are and ladies. Uh, and I really want to get on to the, or I'm going to be on the same show. So it gives me some props. People are like, yeah, I'm really interested. He's, he's got some, he had Ellis Hammond on last week. That's amazing. Let's, let's figure out, uh, if this guy's worth his salt, we already know Zach, Zach's cool, but let's find out more about George. So you're helping yourself. And then after the show, you do such a good job of following up with a, just a killer email of here's what we talked about. Here's what I'm about to post. Could you help me grow my network and grow my net worth and help you do the same Zach. So I appreciate all those things. Yeah. And, and I, and I uh, love your scientific brain being applied to commercial real estate. Well, thank you so much for those kind words. And you do the same, obviously. I love your graphics that you sent out and these are podcasting tips really have to promote the podcast uh, people regardless. And I was surprised by this. Doesn't matter the quality of the guest. People don't just flock to your podcast. You have to get out there and beat the drum. I will give you a, I'll give your viewers a tip. I'm going to hold this up, but I know it's also uh, on. This is my list of all of my targets. So I'm trying to get on every one of these, Joe, you're, or, uh, uh, George, you're right there. But Love I, it. I'll send you this. I'll send you this list. But I have a <laughs> list of 200 podcasts that I would like to be on. Each of these are uh, heavily followed podcasts about real estate. They're all looking right. for guests and what they need to know and what you do, George, which I love is you give a very quick uh, three sentence. Here's who I am. Here's what I'm trying to do. And here's how I can provide value to you podcasting friend. And I'm seeking you out now, if they want to you know, follow up, of course, but if they want to have you on their show, they're going to go research you or their team is going to go research you, but it really requires that first step, George identify the shows you want to be on, learn about those shows, learn about the hosts, learn about the audience that they are trying to cater to or provide value for, and then frame yourself or your business in the context of their audience and the context of the host. Both of those are going to get you onto more podcasts and then help you get your name out there because we individually, George, only have so much of a reach right? We have 20,000 or 30,000 people that follow us on LinkedIn. But outside of that reach, uh, we really rely on our network and people like George saying, hey, Zach's the number one guy. And you're going to really, really love his podcast, Coffee with CRE Closers. Check me out on it. And so all of those things above will help uh, your audience, George, grow. And I think they should reach out to you. If you want to be on George's show on the Foundry, reach out <laughs> sure, to absolutely. George. If if you want us to be on CRE Pro Coffee with Closers, uh, reach out to Zach and maybe we'll uh, do another one here soon, George. I right, just make sure everybody uh, knows how to find you. What's the best way to reach out to Zach? I can be found through the course. The, it's our easiest way. We're doing a great yeah. refresh right now. It's C-R-E-P-R-O course, CRE Pro course. So it stands for Commercial Real Estate Professionals course, but CRE pro course. And, uh, my contact is all in there. My, uh, my VA, my teams, all these guys will send me the, the email. So yeah, reach out. If you, if you have any questions about commercial real estate, you're coming to Austin and you want to, uh, learn the newest, coolest stuff. Uh, or if you have any tips, tricks, uh, systems, anything for a commercial real estate, uh, professional of any type, whether that's an agent, broker, developer, investor, uh, check out CRE Pro Course and Coffee with Closers is our podcast. I'll include that in your notes here as well, uh, George. Amazing. Love Particularly that for your approach. episode. You're coming up on our episode list here, man. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Love that systematic approach. 200 podcasts. And I'm sure that you're going to be on the vast majority of those. Awesome work. Thank you so much for showing up today. Thank you for hosting. You do a great job and continue the hard work, George. All right. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Ha, 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 ha.